Hello, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this California State Parks Ports Cast. My name is Alex, and I'm a member of the Ports team. Ports stands for Parks Online Resources for Teachers and Students. So make sure to check out ports-ca.us for other fun and engaging educational virtual experiences through California State Parks. I am so excited to invite you down to the rocky shoreline today. Welcome to beautiful Crystal Cove State Park down here in Southern California. California in Orange County. And we're going to take um, a look here at this beautiful coast rocky shoreline so we can learn about this very exciting habitat, this ocean habitat behind me called the tide pools or the intertidal zone. So today we're going to be learning what does it take to build a tide pool ecosystem, a tide pool habitat? Then we'll take an up close look at some of the fascinating adaptations that tide pool animals use to um, survive in their environment. And finally, we're going to learn how we can all help protect um, our tide pools by following the rules that we have here in our Marine Protected Area or MPA. We're in a very special place today. It's a Marine Protected Area. MPAs are like protected wilderness parks on land, just under the water. So we have special rules we follow to help protect all of the wildlife there. So um, during my program today, this is what we'll be learning about. And at the very end, we're going to take a dip inside of an actual tide pool so we can see what it would be like to feel like to be a crab inside of a little tide pool. So I'm very excited to have you guys here with me today. Again, my name is Alex. This is a California state park. So we are a protected wilderness park and it's our job to preserve and protect all the plants and animals and also to provide fun or outdoor activities for the public to enjoy. And it's my job to share fun and interesting information about the natural resources that make this park so special. So I'm so happy to have you with me. Now, first of all, where am I? Where is Crystal Cove State Park? I'm going to share with you a map. So you can see where I am. And I'm also going to show you some pictures of this park in case you ever have a chance to visit and explore because California State Parks are your parks to enjoy. All right. So here we have the state of California. If you see that red arrow at the bottom of your screen, that's where we are here in Orange County in between the big cities of Los Angeles and San Diego. If you know where Disneyland is, many students know where Disneyland is, but we are on the coastline here in Orange County. And we have 2,400 acres of backcountry wilderness with 18 miles of hiking trails. How many of you like to go hiking, exploring, looking for bugs or birds. I am a bird nerd, so I'm always looking for different bird species. This is the California state bird, the California quail, and it goes Chicago, 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 Chicago. So if you hear that in the back in the bushes, it might be a, a California state bird. We also have reptiles like lizards and snakes. Maybe that's your thing. This is a Southern Pacific rattlesnake letting us know it's on the trail. We like our snakes for keeping, keeping the rodent population in check. And if we do get rain, we get these beautiful little wildflowers in the spring. We did get some rain this year here in Southern California. So excited to see if there may be a super bloom. But where I'm standing is on our three mile stretch of coastline. We have 3.2 miles of beach. We have sandy shoreline, rocky shoreline that we'll learn about today, different kinds of ocean habitats. If you were to put on swim goggles and go swimming here at Crystal Cove State Park, you would be in an underwater forest of seaweed called a kelp forest. A very, very critical habitat for animals, marine mammals, seals, dolphins, also small invertebrates like snails and schools of fish. And if you were to go snorkeling here at the park, you can go snorkeling, surfing. Um, you might see the California state fish. This is the California the Garibaldi right here with a heart-shaped tail. It's really the only tropical kind of bright colored fish that we have here down in Southern California. And we also have dolphins. Keep your eyes peeled on the coast behind me as I'm talking because we see dolphins almost every day here at Crystal Cove State Park. And who likes sharks? I just love sharks in the park. This is a swell shark resting on some prickly sea urchins. And um, finally, who do we have next? We have our California sea lion popping its little slippery head out of the water. So like I said, keep your eyes peeled today. And if you have a chance to come down to Orange County, we want you to visit Crystal Cove State Park. But what I'd like you guys to do now is I'm just going to turn the camera around and I'd like you to make some quiet observations to yourself. Just look at what I show you, absorb the scenery, and think about what it would feel like to be with me here today at beautiful Crystal Cove State Park. So let's open up our senses this morning. What do you think it would smell like in the air? I smell a hint of salt. 
what would it feel like? I feel a cool breeze on my skin. It's been pretty cool in the morning for us here in Southern California. Um, that water is about 56 degrees. That's very cold. So we don't see any people in the water, any people actually. Um, we don't see much cloud, some haze. And then if you guys look right in the center of your screen there, that is an island called Catalina Island, Santa Catalina Island, one of the Channel Islands, about 26 miles offshore there. Keep your eyes peeled. Also, gray whales are still migrating down to Mexico to give birth to their calves. So if you see a puff on the water, it could be a gray whale migrating. Now, I want you to notice this portion of the beach where these people are exploring. What is different about the southern portion of the beach compared to this northern portion of our beach. What don't you see over here that we're seeing right behind me? So we'll turn the camera around. So hopefully you notice that we have rocks. It's rocking out there. So because we have a rocky shoreline, we're able to have a tide pool habitat. Now who can tell me what is a habitat? Maybe if you're sitting with somebody, you can talk with them next to them, pair and share. What do you think is a habitat? So a habitat is a natural home for both plants and animals. And this is an ocean habitat. And in order to build our tide pool habitat, you just need three things, okay? Three key ingredients. First, we know we need rocks, right? You can't find tide pools on a sandy shoreline, only a rocky shoreline. Then what do you see out there? What do we hear crashing? That water, so ocean water at low tide. So we have rocks, we have ocean water. What's the last piece of the puzzle that we need to build that tide pool habitat? What would you like to see if you were to go to the tide pools? Maybe some marine life, like a lobster. This is the California spiny lobster. Maybe some seaweed, right? So living organisms. So anywhere on planet Earth, if you have a rocky shoreline with ocean water at low tide and living organisms, then you have a tide pool habitat. Now, <clears throat> every day the tide is changing from a high tide to a low tide. That means this coastline is gonna look very different in six hours. That water will pull up and cover all of the rocks. So we took two photographs here in the park at the same beach, just different times of the day. So you can see the difference between a high tide and a low tide. Here we go. So this is Morrow Beach at the southern end of our park. And if you see, look at the bottom of the screen, this is high tide. So you see the water has come all the way up, stretching almost all the way up to this highway right here. And then at the top of the screen, it's six hours later, look how the water has pulled back there showing us those rocks. And at low tide, when the water pulls back, there are pools of ocean water resting in these rocks. And if you peek inside of these pools, there is a thriving community of organisms. Look at all the life bursting out of this one pool. Look at all of the biodiversity. Let's break that word down. Bio meaning life, diversity meaning variety of species. Biodiversity is very important for a healthy habitat. So I spy with my little eye five sea stars. I see some sea urchins, sea anemone, so much life. And tide pools are broken up into different levels or zones, and they're just different species that live in the different levels. And they all have different ways of surviving because the different levels are different, the different zones. Now, before we dive into our tide pool animal adaptations, why does this happen every day? Why do we have a high tide and a low tide two times every day here in California? What causes the tides? Take a moment to think about this. Why do we have tides changing? Well, many people think that tidal changes are caused by the weather or the wind, but actually the answer is out of this world. So do you guys know that force that's holding you down right now, wherever you're sitting or standing? It's called gravity. Did you know that objects out in space have gravitational tugs on our planet? So tides are caused by the gravitational pull of the moon and the sun on the earth, but mainly the moon because the moon is a lot closer to the earth than the sun. 
So again, tides are caused by the gravitational pull of the moon and the sun on the earth. And if you see in this image that moon, the moon orbits the earth or goes around it. And wherever it is over the face of the ocean, it draws that bulge of water towards it. So you can think of the moon kind of like a magnet tugging at that ocean water, pulling it over the rock. So you just need to know that tides aren't caused by um, weather patterns or currents. It's caused by the gravitational pull of the moon on the earth. Now, life in the tide pools is really tough. Imagine for a moment you're a sea star and you're out there on the rocks. Why do you think it might be challenging to live in a tide pool habitat if you were a tide pool animal? What challenges would these animals face as the tide changes there? So you can think about this for a moment. You're a sea star out there. Why might it be tough to live on a rocky shoreline? All right, well, first of all, I have this umbrella with me here today. Do you think it's because it's raining? No, it's because it gets really hot. So at low tide, when the water pulls back, the sun is beating down on these animals. Do you think a sea star has an umbrella out there on the rocks? No. So the animals have to have ways to conserve their moisture, to hold on to their wetness. Also, um, how many of you have been to the beach before? Maybe you haven't been, but you're excited to go. How many of you have been knocked over by an ocean wave? <laughs> I have. It's called getting tumbled. Is that ocean strong? Yeah, so those waves are pounding, pounding on the sea star out there on the rock. So we have the sun coming down, we have the waves pounding, the animal has to hold on tight. Also, as the tide comes in, it could bring in resources like food, but then it might take those resources away. It could bring a predator into your pool, then you may have to have ways to hide. The water temperature is always changing as the tide changes, the water level. So how do these animals survive out there on the rocky shoreline? Well, they use their adaptations. Have you heard of adaptations before? So adaptations are inherited traits that plants and animals use to survive in their environment. And you have adaptations too. Let's see your fingers. Everybody wiggle your fingers. We've developed fingers over time to grasp things. Everybody glue your fingers shut. Imagine all the things you couldn't do if you didn't have your fingers. Could you play with your switch? You might be able to figure out a way, right? <laughs> Everybody feel your hair. Most of us have hair to keep our head warm, to keep us from getting sunburned. Tickle your eyelashes. These are adaptations to keep dust out of our eyes. So we're going to look at some of the cool adaptations of these tide pool organisms. Now, how many of you have seen the movie Finding Nemo? I just love that movie. So in the beginning of Finding Nemo, Nemo and his dad live inside of an ocean creature. Everybody put your pinkies together and your thumbs together. Hold your wrists still and just move your fingers like this. You're holding this animal in your hand. What is the name of this tide pool animal that Nemo and his dad lived inside? This is a toy model. So imagine all of these tentacles aren't hard, but they're squishy, they're swaying around. Think about what is the name of this animal? It's kind of hard to say. There's my clue. All right. It's a sea anemone. 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 So sea anemones are named after flowers because at high tide when the water covers them, they open up and they look like an underwater sea flower. Everybody put out your arms like me and sway side to side and be an underwater sea flower. But instead of petals, they have tentacles with stinging cells that they use to zap their prey. They eat plants or meat, anything floating by. They are omnivores and they bring the food to the center of their body. See right here where the hole is? That's also where they poop. Where they eat is where they excrete their waste, which is kind of interesting. Here we have some giant green anemones and they get their color from seaweed that grows inside of them. And then the seaweed is protected by those stinging tentacles and the sea anemone gets nutrients like oxygen from that seaweed inside. So that's a pretty cool relationship out there in this ecosystem. And what's interesting is at low tide when the water pulls back, these sea anemones completely change and they look like this. This is the same animal at low tide when the water has pulled back. They pull all of their tentacles in and they look like a mushy brown donut with shell sprinkles on top. Now, why do you think a sea anemone would decorate its body with bits of seashells at low tide? How would the shells help the animal? So take a moment, imagine you're a sea anemone, it's low tide, there's no water. Why would you put these little seashells on yourself? 
All right. Well, who knows that adaptation word for when plants and animals blend in with their surroundings? You can all say it. Camouflage, right? So camouflage is the word we use for when plants and animals blend in. So you'd walk right by a sea anemone and you wouldn't even notice it was there. But also remember I said it gets hot in the tide pools. So when we're out in the sun and our skin is exposed, what do we put on our skin to protect ourselves? We use sunscreen. Right, so just like I put on my banana boat, our sea anemones are putting little bits of shells on their body to make shade for themselves, like little shell umbrellas. So this is the first way that you can help protect tide pool animals in a marine protected area. We never collect shells from the beach and take them home because shells are homes for other animals, but even bits of shells we just learned are used by the sea anemones to survive. So everything that is in the habitat should stay there to keep that habitat or ecosystem really healthy. All right, so who is up for an animal clue guessing game? I am. Get ready, I want you to put on your thinking caps, put on your scientist hats, your idea hats, and I'm going to show you some pictures of tide pool animals. And I'm going to say some animal clues. And then I want you to guess which animal I'm referring to. We'll learn about that animal. So we have the sea star, the octopus, the lobster, sea urchin, sea snail, and a hermit crab. Okay, here are my animal clues. I am a master of camouflage and I have a hard beak like a bird. Which animal is a master of camouflage and has a hard beak like a bird? On the count of three, one, two, three, it's our octopus. Octopus are highly intelligent animals. They're very smart. They're known for playing games and problem solving. They're even known for their defense mechanisms, the ways they protect themselves. They can squirt out a purple cloud of ink, propel into the darkness, away from a predator like a seal or a shark. And they don't have a backbone. They're like jelly. Everybody feel your spine that holds us up straight. We have a backbone, so we are called vertebrates. What do we call animals that don't have a backbone? An invertebrate. So because they are invertebrates, they can squish into very tight spaces to hide from predators. And underneath their body, they're covered in hundreds of these suckers under their eight long arms, octopus have eight arms, and they use those suckers to grip onto the rocks when the waves are crashing. We're gonna show you the species of octopus that we have here in Southern California called a two-spot octopus. And they're called a two-spot octopus because they have two fake eyeballs underneath their real eyes. So if you see that blue spot, here's a beautiful two-spot octopus. This blue spot right here, oopsies, blue spot right here, is going to grow larger and then make the animal appear bigger to predators. Pretty smart, right? And then here's an excellent example of an octopus using its camouflage, camouflage capability. Many people ask, how does, it, how does an octopus change colors? Well, they have cells spread all over their skin called chromatophores, and they're like jelly sacks filled with colors, like yellow or brown or black. And they can squeeze those colors and stretch the colors to blend in with their surroundings. They can even change their texture, look at the little bumps up here, to look like a rocky, pebbly sea floor or seaweed. And here's an up close look at their suckers. They use those suckers to hold on tight when the waves are crashing on the rocks, also to move around, move your body around. We call that locomotion in the animal world. They also use their suckers to taste. Like we use our tongue to lick a lollipop, they can actually taste a fish or a crab or a clam. And because they don't have a backbone, they can squish into tight spaces, fit into little spaces, any space the size of their mouth. How, wouldn't it be so cool if you could just kind of turn into jelly and slip underneath the door jam, doorway? That'd be so cool. And then here we have a, a picture of an octopus squirting out its purple ink from a sack inside its body. They squirt, release that ink when they're star startled or threatened and it forms a blob and then they jet propulsion backwards and it makes the blob turn into like the shape of an octopus kind of, so cool. And did you know that squid and octopus have a hard beak like a bird? So octopus only eat meat. What do we call animals that only eat meat? They're called carnivores. So um, octopus really like to eat crabs and crabs wear their skeleton on the outside of their body called an exoskeleton. So octopus need these hard beaks to crunch down on those crabs. 
All right, shall we do one more animal? Everybody put on your thinking caps, your scientist hats, your idea hats. And I'm going to show you these animals again. What are my clues gonna be? This is such a fun, fun morning with you guys. Okay, here we have our sea star, octopus, lobster, sea urchin, sea snail, and our hermit crab. Here are my animal clues. I have five arms. I can have five arms, but I have hundreds of feet. Which animal on the screen has five arms? Remember, not legs, but arms, and hundreds of feet. What do you think? Okay, on the count of three, one, two, three, it's our sea star, the star of the rocks. This is a real sea star. It's just no longer alive, so we use it for education. And did you know some sea stars can have up to 20 arms or rays? Can you imagine having 20 arms, all the things you could get done in a day? <laughs> but um, the ones we typically see here have five arms. At the tip of each arm, they have an eye spot but they don't see exactly how we do. They sense light and dark, things like that. And if you feel them, if you've ever felt one in a touch tank or aquarium, do they feel soft or bumpy? Kind of bumpy, right? So they're related to other spiny skinned animals in the ocean like sea urchins. And they're carnivores like the um, octopus. This is their mouth right here. And then all along their arms, they're covered in hundreds of feet. So you know how we use our feet move, to move around, so do they, but their feet look a little different than our feet. So here's the arm of a sea star stretching that, those two feet off of its arm. They look like pieces of spaghetti with suction cups at the tips. And they use those to grip onto the rocks when the waves are crashing. This is another way, listen up guys, that you can help protect tide pool animals. In a marine protected area, we don't pick up the animals um, because it scares them. But if you try to pick up a sea star, it might rip, you might rip off its feet. So that's why we leave the animals where we are. Try not to disturb them, be friendly giants. Now I said they like to eat meat. What do you think is a sea star's favorite food in the tide pools? Here's my clue if you can see me. What am I flexing? Okay, on the count of three, one, two, three, muscles. Show me your muscles. Here's a big bed or colony of muscles all clumped together here. Um, they live in a tight clump like that to make shade for themselves. Also, many animals know there are strength in numbers, you know, like wolves hang out in a pack. They're less likely to be eaten or attacked if they live in a group together, helping each other. So if we see this hungry sea star moving up toward that bed of mussels, here is our mussel. Let's take a moment for our mussel. Mussels are sea snails with two shells and a soft body inside. They're filter feeding organisms. So they pump seawater through their body and they eat plankton. They glean little tiny microscopic um, animal and plant organisms out of the water. But how does a sea star eat a mussel? Well, it's really wild, guys. Fasten your seatbelt. So here is our hungry sea star. It's going to use its two feet to crawl over the rocks, to crawl on top of the mussel, and then hold on tight. And then the sea star uses its two feet to pull apart the two shells just a crack. And then the sea star throws up its stomach into the muscle, turns the muscle into a muscle milkshake using digestive enzymes, and then slurps the muscle back up into its body with its stomach. Isn't that crazy? Can you imagine throwing up your stomach to eat your dinner at the dinner table and sucking it all back in with your food? That would be crazy. All right, now, because we mentioned our muscles, we, we should talk about our shells a little bit. Have you guys ever held a shell in your hand? Maybe you haven't, but you've seen them, seen them somewhere or listen for the ocean in a shell. Well, every shell tells a story because every shell was once alive. It was once a sea snail. So sea snails are born with their shell and grow with their shell. What an excellent adaptation. How would you use this shell if you were a sea snail, soft little sea snail? This shell would be used as your home, your shelter, your protection. Sea snails can pull their entire body inside and shut a trap door called an operculum at low tide. And that way they don't dry out in the hot sun at low tide. But what is an animal that might crawl inside of an empty sea snail shell and use it as its home? By the way, this is a wavy top turban sea snail shell. And we also have, there are many different kinds of 
sea snails, which means there are many different kinds of shells. This here we have is our abalone shell, one of my favorite shells. It looks like a rainbow was melted inside. These are really cool animals that we see here, and some of them are threatened and endangered. The black and white abalone are endangered species now. But what is an animal that might crawl inside of an empty sea snail shell and use it as its home? It is our hermit crab. So hermit crabs are like the garbage collectors of the tide pools. That's their job. They keep everything clean. They eat plants and meat. So what do we call animals that eat plants and meat? I mentioned earlier, it's our omnivore, but they also eat dead things. So they're scavengers as well. And notice how this one has a different shell on its back than in the first image. It's the same species, our blue banded hermit crab. <laughs> this one's taking a little rest out on the land. Here's, I love this one, it's tucked inside of its shell. But I mentioned that they had different shells on their back, different photos. Well, there's a reason for that. If you're going to visit the tide pools, guys, and you want to see wildlife, it's really important that you be patient and wait. It's my suggestion to go up to one pool. It could be really small or really large. And then just look straight in the center and wait. And that's when you're going to see all of the life creep out of the shadows. The whole pool will show all of its biodiversity. And um, when we take a dip inside of our tide pool, you'll get a chance to take a look at that. But if you're very patient and you wait and you're staring into a pool, you may see this. Now, at first glance, this could be just an empty shell, right? No one's home. But if you're patient, it could wiggle and it might be a sea snail, right? Or sea snails born with their shell, grow with their shell, munching on algae. But if you're very patient, it could become a hermit crab. Now, hermit crabs are actually born naked, just like you and me. They don't have a shell. So they have to find an empty sea snail shell and crawl inside. But as they grow, is the shell growing with them? No. So what do they have to do? They have to crawl out and find a bigger shell. Then it gets so tight, they might have to crawl out and find a bigger shell until they're a full adult hermit crab. So just like you get too big for your clothing, you need to find the next size up. Our hermit crabs rely on those larger sea snail shells for their homes. So now let's talk about the ways we can help protect the tide pool animals in our marine protected area here our state marine conservation area at Crystal Cove State Park. So rule number one, do we want to collect the shells from the beach? No, and why? Because our shells are homes for the hermit crabs and even bits of shells are used by sea anemones. So we never collect the shells from the beach. We also don't wanna take the animals home. If we try to take the animals home, we don't have what they need to survive. So they're not going to live and that won't be fun for anyone, right? So we leave the shells and the animals in the tide pools. Let's take a look at this tide pool home. Do you notice where it is? It's right where we like to explore and play. I see people right now about to go exploring. So that means it's a vulnerable habitat to human impact. Human impact is how humans affect a habitat. So when we visit, we need to be friendly giants to these tiny little critters in their home. That's their home and we're coming inside. Can you imagine if you were in your living room and a stranger opened your front door, walked in and started touching all your stuff? <laughs> That wouldn't be very nice, right? So we want to be respectful. So we never collect the animals. We never collect the shells. Do you think we want to run and jump in the tide pools? No, because if you hear a crunch or a slurp, you could be stepping on a living organism. Also, it's very slippery in the tide pools. That's for your safety. Safety is first. Um, we never put our feet in the pools. We never put our hands in the pools. Uh, we just look with our eyes and not with our hands. And then we never turn over rocks because there are little animals under those rocks. And we don't pick up an animal out of its pool and move it out of its pool. That's like if a big alien came down into your room or classroom right now, picked you up out of your seat and put you on a different planet. Very disorienting for the animals when they don't know where their food, their shelter, their space is. So we're just very friendly and respectful in these tide pool habitats. And lastly, you wanna have fun. Because the more that you have fun being outside, engaged with nature and different kinds of habitats, the more you're going to learn why we want to help protect the ocean and ocean homes, different ocean habitats like the tide pools. So before we take our dip inside of a tide pool, I wanna ask you, take a moment right now, why do you think it's important to protect the ocean and ocean habitats?
We're looking at the largest ocean here, the Pacific Ocean, right behind me. What's the big deal about the ocean? Why should we protect it? So take a moment, think about that. All right, well, first of all, if you have a favorite ocean animal, maybe it's a killer whale or a squid, the only way to protect an animal is to protect the habitat around it. So when we protect the ocean, we protect all of the wildlife, you know, the plants and animals under the water. So that's great. We have threatened and almost endangered animals. So if we protect the ocean, we can help those animals. Um, also, the ocean helps regulate our climate. So no matter where you live, you are connected to the sea. The ocean helps regulate our climate. How many of you guys eat fish every once in a while sometimes? Sometimes I eat fish. So the ocean gives us food. The ocean gives us jobs. We transport things and people over the ocean. But I want everybody to take one big breath in and one big breath out. <sighs> Did you know that more than 50% of the oxygen that we breathe every day comes from the ocean? So over 50% of the air that you breathe every day comes from the ocean. And how is that possible? Well, who knows this guy? <laughs> Who's this? This is plankton. So plankton are real. Plankton is a character on SpongeBob SquarePants, but, but plankton are real. Plankton are microscopic plant and animal organisms floating around in the ocean. The animal plankton will grow up to be animals like sea stars and octopus. They're called zooplankton. So think of zoo, think of animals in a zoo. But the plant plankton is called phytoplankton. And some of them will remain small and they're floating on the surface of the ocean. Here's our plankton. Our phytoplankton is floating on the surface of the ocean all around the earth, ocean covering more than 70% of our planet. And the sun comes down and through a process, we get the air that we breathe. So when we take care of the ocean, we take care of the lungs of our planet, the lungs of the earth. And I love breathing fresh air. I hope that you guys do too. And listen up, this is the most important part before we dive into the tide pools. You guys are our future scientists. You guys are the future educators, the future thinkers who are going to create solutions to the problems that we have on this one planet and this one ocean. We only have one planet and one ocean to protect, and it's up to you. So I'm so excited that you guys got to come down and learn a little bit more, get a little bit more connected with this specific marine habitat, the tide pools today. Now, how many of you guys would like to be transformed into a crab and take a dip inside of an actual tide pool? I would like to do that. Okay, so I'm going to, well, I'm, I'm waving my magic wand. You guys are all now crabs, a bunch of crabby little crabs this morning. And I'm going to share my screen. I took an underwater camera with me, a GoPro camera, and I gently put it inside of my favorite tide pool here at Crystal Cove so that we can kind of get a glimpse and an idea of what it would be like to take a dip inside of a tide pool and be a crab. All right, so this is called Rocky Bite, this area of the park at Crystal Cove State Park, where we have tide pools at low tide. Crabs don't fly, so, okay, now we're landing on some barnacles. Look at those closed up sea anemones on the rock wall across the way. Wow. It doesn't look so small anymore once we're inside, right? So you see those aggregating sea anemones. Sea anemones can break into two and form two different individuals. So they can clone, which is pretty cool. If we're a crab, do we want to step on those stinging tentacles? No. So notice the seaweed, that surf grass, coralline algae. Um, seaweed is so important for, for creating shelter and hiding spaces for these little organisms in the tide pools. Now we're going to take a little trip outside of the pool. What do you guys see? Still more life happening outside of this pool. See those sea snails attached to the rocks? I saw a striped shore crab. Do you see those holes of sand? There's tunnels of sand attached to the rocks. There are worms inside called sand castle worms. And they made those tunnels of sand using their spit. They stuck each individual grain of sand together using their saliva, which is so cool. All right, and then while we're here, okay, so octopus are my all time favorite animal. And, um, they're hard to see, hard to find because they're so good at blending in. But this one time I had my 
phone with me. And so I was able to capture this footage of a two spot octopus slinking across the tide pool floor. Watch as it changes colors to that red algae growing those little bumps on its mantle, its big head. Interesting, octopus are so intelligent. They have a really short lifespan, such an intelligent animal. They only live to be about two to three years old. Some can live to be five. Just a fun fact. All right. Well, <laughs> thank you guys so much for joining me here today. This has been such a wonderful morning, a wonderful day to start a wonderful way to start our morning. I hope that you had fun learning about this tide pool habitat and some of the animal adaptations in this marine protected area or MPA. Also, I hope you guys know, remember what I said that you guys are our future and I'm so grateful that you guys took a little took a little time to come and learn about this habitat. And if you ever have the chance, please come and visit Crystal Cove State Park, this California state park. And remember to check out ports-ca.us for other ports casts like these one, like this one, but in a different park. All right, I hope you guys have a wonderful day. I'm going to leave you with the beautiful Pacific Ocean. Ooh, look at the waves crashing, as I'm showing you. Maybe keep your eyes peeled for a dolphin or the spout of a gray whale. Have a spectacular day and a happy and healthy rest of your school year.